some analysis on that. Of course, we have social media channels for you to join us uh, via today. Facebook is one of them. We're live streaming on Facebook, Splash FM 106.7. We're working to get Facebook on right now, but WhatsApp is on standby for you to send your comments in. Our WhatsApp line is 0817-555-1067. 0817-555-1067. For today, we have an additional platform that you can engage with us on, and that is Zoom. Just like on Friday, Independence Day, when we had a Zoom special, Today, our guest will be joining us via Zoom, and anyone else Hello, interested can join us via Zoom as well. Drop their comments there and signify later on if they want to contribute verbally to the program. Now, we've already laid the groundwork for who will be reviewing as our guest today. Yesterday, if you listened yesterday towards the tail end of the show, I ask that you get acquainted with an expose released by investigative journalist David Hundey, where he made some pretty jaw-dropping revelations. And today we'll be looking at these revelations as our issue of the day. Our guest this morning is David Hundey. And David is a writer, investigative journalist, and broadcaster. His work has appeared on CNN, The Africa Report, The New Yorker Magazine, and The Washington Post. His work as a satirist on the other news, Nigeria's answer to The Daily Show has featured in the New Yorker magazine and in the Netflix documentary, Larry Charles' Dangerous World of Comedy. In 2018, it was nominated by the U.S. State Department for the 2019 Edward Murray Program for Journalists under the International Visitors Leadership Program, VLP. In February 2021, he won the People Journalism Prize for Africa 2020. And in June this year, he was selected as Africa's only representative on a list of 12 writers and journalists from around the world to take part in the inaugural $1 million Substack <clears throat> local program. We'll connect with David shortly via Zoom, and then we'll be back to take your contributions uh, or to actually discuss the show before we take your contributions on our issue of the day. So please stay with us. Panorama is in full swing. <laughs> back it's still panorama on the integrity station splash 106.7 fm i am lola miruteni and i'm bringing up fire thank you very much for staying with us and then um, like lola rightly referenced just before we proceeded on that very short break i show the day today is in revelations from the boko haram origin story well, I'm like to allow some reference, you hear some jaw dropping revelations, which you, uh, pretty much is in the public space already. And so I'm sure there are a lot of people who are pretty cognizant with all of those things that has been referenced. But our guest once again is David Lee, He's joining us now via Zoom. Uh, just here, David, good morning. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us, David. Second appearance in less than a week. The abridged version, the right. revelation in your had give us a bridge well. Okay, so there appears to be some sort of audio interference on the Zoom call. I don't know if you can please tell the other participants to mute their mic. We'll try to set that out. Uh, Just give, give, us a, give us a few seconds. Okay. 
I'm going to do this in this one. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, we've sorted out that so we can have a seamless conversation. David, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. All right, so let's have that abridged version of your investigative piece titled Conflicts for Jihad, the Boko Haram origin story, which has, of course, everyone talking about it on social media. Okay, so um, essentially, this is a story that attempts to um, tell the or, or, or at least give readers a, a wider angle on the actual origin of Boko Haram, because um, the story that is often, that is most often told is that Boko Haram started with a man called Muhammad Yusuf, who was a sort of charismatic Salafi preacher who developed a sort of cult following around him. And then his followers rebelled against the Nigerian state. And then there was a crackdown in 2009. He was shot dead by the police in Meduguri. Um, his deputy Abu Bakr Shekau took over and was was more violent than he was, and that was how Boko Haram started. In actual fact, that's sort of like starting a story from the middle of the book instead of from the beginning. Yeah. So what I what, what this story attempted to do was to take the story right back to the beginning, where the context that existed for someone like Muhammad Yusuf to exist in the first place. So the story begins in the 1970s, when um, uh, one of the most influential uh, sort of um, uh, Islamic religious figures in in the in northern Nigeria, whose name is uh, Abu Bakr Mahmoud Gumi, um, loses his benefactor, who is uh, the the, uh, the the former um, premier of northern Nigeria, uh, Sir Ahmadu Bello. So um, to fill this vacuum, because he feels vulnerable, because the new leadership of Nigeria, which is a, a, a military leadership, has a, has an incentive to go after him because he's outspoken, he's influential. And he's, uh, he has a following. And this and obviously the military would view that as a threat. So to save his own skin and to, and to get uh, a new benefactor, he goes to Saudi Arabia. Uh, bear in mind that this is in the 1970s, Saudi Arabia has more money than he knows what to do with. So uh, the Saudis are basically using their, their petrodollars to uh, export the, the, Saudi, the Saudi state's official interpretation of Sunni Islam. Now, the Saudi state's official interpretation of Sunni Islam is heavily influenced by the work of uh, an Islamic scholar known as Ibn al-Wahhab. So their doctrine is referred to as Wahhabism. Right. Wahhabi now, um, up until this point, the, the sort of Islam, Islam has been practiced in Nigeria, northern Nigeria for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. But up until this point, the type of Islam that has been practiced generally is quite benign generally i'm not saying that it was 100 percent peaceful but generally was quite benign sufi islam which was mainly the two orders the tijania order and the kadria order now um with the entry of this wahhabi islam into nigeria via sheikh uh, abu Bakr mahmoud gumi that starts to change because wahhabi islam is an extremely conservative an extremely uh, an, an, an extremist interpretation of the Sunni doctrine. Uh, so over the next two or three decades, uh, as this movement, that this unofficial movement that is building around Abu Bakr Gumi starts to grow, uh, the movement doesn't have a name yet. It doesn't, it's not even an official, it's not even a movement per se, it's just a sort of loose coalition mm. of people whom this preacher has influence over because he used to be a prominent teacher and he's also very, he makes uh, regular TV and radio appearances, particularly on Radio Kaduna, where he has this sort of fiery, impassioned uh, critiques of the existing Sufi Islamic orders in the North, 
because he is trying to advocate for this sort of like really like um, fundamentalist, you know, uh, essentialist interpretation of Sunni Islam. Right. So basically, over the next three decades, uh, so, so okay, well, I should start from 1970. In 1978, one of his uh, his his uh, senior students, Sheikh Idris, then takes this movement, which up until this point is unofficial, makes it official, gives it a name, uh, and it comes to be known as the Zala movement or the Jibwis, right? Mm -hmm. And over the next two to three decades, the Zala movement eats up northern Nigeria. It becomes possibly the most influential. Islamic body in northern Nigeria. It becomes uh, almost impossible to rise to power or to high office without identifying with the Zara movement or without being or without the blessing of the Zara movement. And it just so happens that the Zara movement, uh, the, the, the type of Islam which is popularized by the Zara movement is, is, uh, is Salafism. Now, Salafism goes hand in hand with Wahhabism. Wahhabism is uh, I would say probably a little less extreme than Salafism. Salafism is the extreme interpretation of the Wahhabi doctrine, right? And these people subscribe to uh, Salafi Islam. So that's where the initial problem starts from because up until this point, the sort of Islam that was in practice in Nigeria is relatively benign. Now, this new, uh, this, this imported version from Saudi Arabia is coming and uh, all of a sudden you, you now have uh, this sort of heavy divisions within the Islamic uh, uh, faith in northern Nigeria, where this newfound imported faith has people, uh, Muslims, calling other Muslims infidels because they consider themselves to be the pure ones. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where these problems start from. Now, uh, in 1992, Sheikh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Gumi dies. And by the way, um, Sheikh Gumi is, Sheikh Abubakar Mahmoud Gumi is the father of uh, Sheikh Abubakar Gumi that we know today. Right. So in 92, he dies. Now, um, as at 2000, as at 1999, uh, the uh, military hands over to the civilian administration in Nigeria, uh, President Richard Basanjo, who is a Christian, comes into office. Now, one of the things, one of the controversial, most controversial things that Sheikh Gumi was known for saying in his lifetime was that Muslims, according to his Salafi doctrine, should never accept a non-Muslim as a ruler, which can be interpreted as somebody calling for an insurrection against a Christian president. Uh, he was obviously never brought to book for that statement. That statement was, for, for whatever reason, he, uh, he faced no, no repercussions whatsoever for, for making such you know, a, a claim as an influential person that he was. Now, almost as soon as the president of Basinger came into office in 1999, you then have, you then had uh, 12 of Nigeria's Northern states almost immediately stating that they didn't want to be ruled by the same laws, by the same penal code as the rest of the country. Right. They, wanted their, they wanted their own penal code, which was heavily influenced by Sharia law. And almost as soon as he came in, by so he came in 99, by 2000, Zamfara had already become the first state in Nigeria to adopt Sharia law, followed very rapidly by 11 other northern states. Now, in 2002, and by the way, this, uh, this, this, thing that I'm quoting, it comes from uh, a letter written by the, uh, the Nigerian uh, uh, permanent rep representative to the UN, uh, Ambassador Amin Wali. It was a letter written in 2006 to the UN uh, Counterterrorism Committee, where he was basically stating what Nigeria's efforts at fighting terrorism have been so far. Now, in that letter, it states that in 2002, uh, a certain Yakubu Musa Kafanchan was, uh, was arrested for uh, trying to set up terror cells in, in Kano and Katsina and for setting up Taliban training camps across Northern Nigeria. The same letter he states that somebody else, a, a, a fellow known as um, Haruna Shahru was also arrested for, uh, for money laundering on behalf of terrorist entities, right? That this uh, Haruna Shahru fellow using his network of businesses to launder uh, uh, money through uh, smuggling activities is basically bag holding. He's moving money on behalf of an Algerian Islamist entity called GSPC. Right now, it just so happens that this uh, uh, Yakubu Musa Kafanchan fellow is actually a very well respected uh, Islamic cleric right now in the present day, and he's a very high ranking member of the Zala movement. In fact, he's the current chairman of the board of trustees of the Zala movement, which is possibly the most powerful uh, Islamic body in Northern Nigeria today. Uh, 
Mm. Right? He's also known, he's also known as uh, Yakubu Musa Katsina or Yakubu Musa Hassan. Right. And where the real red flag is, is that this person who, according to the Nigerian government itself, was arrested for terrorism and not just terrorism, but actually organizing terrorism, you know, setting up terror cells, mm. uh, setting up Taliban training camps. This person, uh, apparently, so uh, uh, based on the WikiLeaks cable, which I quoted in the story, uh, it was det- was detained for just 27 days. A federal high court in Abuja ordered his release for whatever reason. I wasn't able to get access to the court documents to, to ascertain exactly why he was released. And from then till now, he has been a free man. And more importantly, not just a free man, but a powerful free man, because this man has access to everybody in Nigeria. So uh, you have the Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, uh, Isa Pantami, repeatedly making public reference to him, uh, repeatedly appearing in pictures with him, referring to him as an elder statesman. This person who is a terrorist, an Mm. elder statesman apparently. And then you have the president himself appearing in a picture with this guy in Asso Rock, standing next to him inside the Federal Executive Council chamber, right? So, and this is someone who, according to the Nigerian government document, a document written by the Nigerian government itself in 2006, states that this person was arrested for setting up terror cells in Kano and Katsina and for setting up Taliban training camps in Northern Nigeria. So how on earth is it possible that this fellow with the kind of baggage that he has and with no um, no known resolution as to his case, the, there's no evidence that, that you know justice was ever served. And now he's not only a very well-respected Islamic cleric and a very high-ranking member of the Izala movement, he's also a powerful person who has access to state governors, to federal ministers and to the president himself. You know, because you know, it's not just anybody who can walk into Asu Rock and take a picture with Mr. President inside the FEC chamber. Mm. Like you have to be a really influential person to be able to do that. So how on earth is this possible? So that was like sort of like the first part of this article that to sort of intimate readers that when we talk about Boko Haram sponsors, right. or they, we always talk about them as if they are people who fall, who fell down from the sky or they are ghosts. You know that these these mythical Boko Haram sponsors. No, no, no. They are not people who are like who are falling from this. They are people that you know. Mm. Like here is an example. Here is one. Here is somebody who quite literally incubated the the Islamic terrorism problem that Nigeria didn't have prior to 1999. This is the guy. This is one of them. Who are, and this is something that Nigerian government itself said. This isn't a claim. That was made anyway. This isn't an allegation. The Nigerian government itself is the one that said this in a letter to the UN. Right. Okay. And yet, the Nigerian government failing entirely to hold this person responsible, to hold him accountable, mm-hmm. and not just that, allowing this person to have access to the very, like, very highest office in the country, barely 20, uh, uh, eighteen years later. So, what is going on? Okay. All right. Uh, before you proceed, uh, so far you've mentioned um, two or three names. You mentioned Sheikh Abubakar Gumi, uh, Abubakar Mahmoud Gumi, the father of the current Sheikh Ahmed Gumi, who is on record as you know making some very controversial statements. You've um, mentioned uh, Yakubu Musa Hassan, Yakubu, who is also known as Yakubu Musa Kafanchano, Yakubu Musa uh, Katsina. Uh, you've pretty much drawn drawn a sort of uh, sad picture, maybe a bleak picture of certain things. Uh, But your piece is important at a time when the federal government has been seemingly reluctant to name the people behind terror, uh, the people perpetrating terror in Nigeria. I mean, the AGF is on record uh, saying that even though the federal government has succeeded in identifying and detaining in quote, high profile individuals responsible for funding terrorist activities in Nigeria, uh, they do not want to name them. So your piece is important in giving us this context. However, these are pretty weighty allegations or these are pretty weighty um, revelations that you have made. So how did you go about compiling this information? You've mentioned the letter sent by the permanent UN representative uh, to the chairman of the counterterrorism committee, but how did you create a picture of what happened as far back as the 1970s? How did you compile this context that you have laid down? So, um, as I said, when I was, I, I answered this exact question during the TV interview yesterday, 
it's the hardest part of the story was actually sort of um, finding ways to cut down the length so that it wouldn't be impossibly long to read because there's actually so much information out there that is readily available. Some of this information was sort of um, on these uh, uh, academic uh, websites. So basically you would have to pay to get access to this data. There's There's been a lot of research that has been done by the likes of Dr. And Andrea Begagler, who used to work at the University of Cape Town Center for Contemporary Islam right. and, other, and other researchers like that. So, but a lot of this, uh, these materials are also freely available on the internet. So for example, um, this letter written by uh, Ambassador Aminu Wali to the UN is freely available on, on, on the UN website. You can find it there. And in fact, I, I included the link in the article. My theory is that the reason that these things weren't big news at the time was probably because this time period between 2002 and 2006, Nigeria didn't have mass internet access to it does now. So I feel like a lot of these things, which were reported in global media, Mm. Or which you know, or, or which were available on the internet simply completely uh, skipped the um the the popular knowledge of nigerians because if a daily newspaper or a terrestrial tv channel or a radio station like yours didn't carry this news at the time there was no way for nigerians to know that such information existed so it's like now in the year 2021 we're now, dis we're now discovering that there are a whole lot of stories you know dating back as far as the 70s like that, you know, if you were to tell them now, it's sort of big news to people, whereas the information has actually been freely available. So, for example, the indictment of the founder of, uh, of, of, um, of, of NASCO Group, that's um, uh, Idris Ahmed Nasreddin, his indictment for uh, moving and laundering money on behalf of terrorist entities, including this GSPC group that Harun Asharu was also implicated with, this information was reported in the LA Times, was reported by NBC News. It was actually quite, it was uh, what you would call big news across the world, but it was never reported in Nigeria. Mm. Because that lack of, uh, that lack of public awareness, that lack of internet access in Nigeria made it such that if one, if somebody was able to either suppress the Nigerian media from carrying this news or induce the Nigerian media to not carry it, Nigerians had no way of knowing. So a lot of people that were, that were reacting to it were, were reacting in shock, which is why I, I keep on hearing the term claims or allegations. These are not claims or allegations. <laughs> I didn't come up with anything. I'm simply quoting publicly available information, confirmed events that happened, mm. mostly that were said by the Nigerian government itself. So the letter from Aminu Wali itself stated that this NASCO group founder had his uh, assets and his company provisionally seized by the federal government because of his indictments for funding terror. That's what the Nigerian government itself said, yeah. right? So it's not an allegation, it's not a claim. It's what happened. Right. It's just that for whatever reason, it was easy to conceal information from Nigerians in 2006. But this is 2021, and I guess part of my job as a journalist is to bring some of these things to light. Some of these things which have been unfairly hidden from Nigerians, because Nigerians have a right to know. So that when the next time we're talking about this thing about oh the funding of Boko Haram, sponsors of Boko Haram, we don't talk about these people as if they are ghosts who appear in the night. We know that these are real people with flesh and blood, people who are very, uh, who, are, who are wealthy, people who have access to power in Nigeria, people who are powerful people in their own right. That this, these are who these people. So this article is not even like an exhaustive list of people who are involved with Islamic terror in Nigeria at a high level. It's just a little... Uh, snapshot just to give the reader an, an idea of how big this issue actually is and to give the reader context as to where the problem of Islamic extremism actually came from. The Islamic extremism and terror in Nigeria did not start with uh, with Mohammed Yusuf, that you can trace it back to the entry of Saudi money and Saudi training and Saudi doctrines into Nigeria in the 1970s. That, and it's very important for, reader, for, for, for readers to understand this because I'm sure many of us have parents who spent some of their some of their life in, in 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 the north or who grew up in the north, and they will always tell us, and I'm sure you you have this experience. They always tell you that the north wasn't always like this. That even the even the way the Islam is, is practiced, it wasn't like this. There was a shift at some point, and they are never able to explain how that shift happened or where it came from. This article is explaining where that shift came from and why it happened. It was Abu Bakr Mahmoud Gumi basically who was responsible for that shift, and the people who financed that shift 
were ba was basically the Saudi government. Like it was the entry of the Wahhabi doctrine into Nigeria via uh, uh, Saudi sponsorship that created this hydra-headed monster that we're facing now. That the Islam that has been practiced in Nigeria for hundreds or maybe thousands of years wasn't making it, wasn't going around beheading people, wasn't going around shooting people. That wasn't the Islam that was practiced, right? This particular strain of Islam that entered Nigeria in the 70s from Saudi Arabia is where the problem came from. And that this uh, society which has built itself around that Salafi doctrine, this Islam society, has now become sort of a state within a state in Nigeria, has become a group that is too influential, that is too powerful, to the point where you now have the president taking pictures in the Federal Executive Council chamber with a known indicted terrorist who has never faced justice. Right. Um, let, let's, you know, look at some of the revelations in that document that you released. I mean, you said that a certain individual has been known to Nigerian security forces, which um, more recently we've heard the likes of governors, uh, ministers, people that are really high up there in the class. But of course, like he also said, they are free men. They are just working and sort to bring them to justice and to bring them to go. Let's look at the security agents now. Are they too incapacitated to carry out their responsibilities at that border on protection? Or do you think it's a matter of these folks, these individuals, just are too powerful that they also call the shot as it, as it concerns security agents? So something I always point out um, when people uh, complain about how the security agents are not doing enough is that based on my understanding of the Nigerian security infrastructure, bear in mind that uh, I grew up in and around the Nigerian government. My dad was a senior civil servant before he retired. Mm -hmm. So I grew up very, very, with a very, very sort of, uh, with a bird's eye view of how the Nigerian government works and how the Nigerian security infrastructure works because this was a military government back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, the Nigerian security agencies for the most, well, <laughs> but let me say the Nigerian intelligence agencies, let me not say the security agencies. So the intelligence agencies focused on domestic or foreign intelligence. So the DSS, the DMI, DIA, NIA, those agencies are actually fairly competent. Right? They are not actually incompetent at all, right? There, I was, I was joking the other day that if you want to even get something as simple as a root contract in Nigeria, the DSS is going to tell you where your father first met your mother. Mm. They're going to vet you to your third generation. They have this information and they do their job quite diligently. The problem is that the um, the Nigerians, the, these agencies do not really have uh, political autonomy, right? So it's up to, I can do my job if I'm as a DSS agent or as a DSS director, I can do my job. I can uh, gather this intelligence. I can do this research. I can write these reports. I can submit it to you. But ultimately, if you, i.e. a politician who is, you know, is ultimately my boss, who, who ultimately my boss, you, are, you, you decide that you're going to sit on this report or you're going to ignore it, there's, not, there's absolutely nothing that, that I can do. And a very uh, clear example of this is what happened in, I think it was April, when the Issa Pantami story came out. Right. And then we had people complaining that, so how did somebody like this become a minister? Didn't the DSS vet him? Oh. And then you had the former director of the DSS, Dennis Amakri, coming out and speaking to a journalist, I think it was any other, I think it was your punch newspaper. And he told him that, look, the DSS did uh, uh, write a, a hefty dossier yeah. on Issa Pantami. And they recommended to the president that Issa Pantami should not be made a minister under any circumstances, that this man has, this man has baggage. Mm. And the president said he chose to ignore them. Mm. I made him a minister anyway. Mm. And that this, uh, for whatever reason, this, this dossier that they wrote, wasn't even presented to the National Assembly when this fellow was being confirmed. If you watch the confirmation, it took just 11 minutes. Mm. So that's how, unfortunately, how it works in Nigeria. Security agencies can only do so much. Mm. There has to be political will for these things to move beyond the talking stage. Or this, like, I'm, I, I, I'm very, very sure that there's nothing I've written in, in this story or in any of stories like this that some that that hasn't already been written in hundred times more detail in some security report somewhere that sits now in a drawer in Abuja somewhere and somebody refused to act on it. So unfortunately, that's just how Nigeria works. It's sadly, would you then say that it also points to the fact that there's already a high infiltration of these individuals in government circles? 
sorry, the, the line, there was some, uh, there was audio interference. Can you please repeat the question? Question again is, does that point to the fact that they believe high level of infiltration of these um, terrorist sponsors, some of them terrorists themselves, already in various strata of government? Yes, yes, exactly. That was exactly what this article was trying to establish, that in addition to the wider context of uh, how Islamic terrorism came to be become a thing in Nigeria, when you know, Northern Nigeria actually is a relatively peaceful place, that these people have now entrenched themselves and have become the system that this, this specifically, this um, Izala society, which essentially is the incubating point for the problems that have come out of political Islam in Nigeria, be it terrorism, be it this whole problem with Sharia law, that this Izala society has become Nigeria's hydra. It has become a state within a state. It has become too powerful. And this needs to become public knowledge because it essentially you have it, you know, I like I'm pretty sure that before this article came out, 90% of the people who read it had no idea what the Zara society was or where it came from. They didn't know anything about it. That was the first time they were hearing anything about it. Meanwhile, this is an entity that controls this much power in Nigeria. So if you have this completely unknown, unelected entity with its own shadowy agenda, which is essentially uh, determining determining uh, 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 security policy and national policy for you, then is it really a democracy anymore? Are, are you really the one determining how your country is being run anymore? So I think it's objectively in the public interest for people to understand that there has been a sort of a soft coup that has taken place in Northern Nigeria and in the, the federal government itself period that this shadowy group now controls, wields way too much power Within the, Niger within the Nigerian federal infrastructure. This group controls pretty much the entire north of Nigeria. And this, the influence of this group needs to be curtailed as a matter of urgency. These people are too powerful and this situation needs to change as a matter of urgency. Mm. Okay, well, you can join us in the conversation via WhatsApp. You can just drop a comment on the WhatsApp platform. It's 0817-555-1067. And to everyone who's listening in from Zoom, you can also drop a comment there as well. It will be read. And as soon as it's time to open phone lines, we'll, of course, probably take your responses. Uh, we're still speaking with David Mundane, who is an investigative journalist, and he's talking to us about his investigative piece, which has shook the internet, shook Nigerians, which we thought to bring to your attention, because it does make some very um, jaw-dropping revelations, as I keep calling them. It's titled Conflicts for Jihad, the Boko Haram Origin Story. Now, the very title of that piece, David, seems to infer that um, the, the, the CEO, the founder of the NASCO group plays a central role in terrorism in Nigeria. However, and you did finger him reading on later on the story, you did um, draw up some documents showing that he was placed on a terror watch list. He was, I'm not sure he was arrested. Some of his assets were definitely forfeited uh, due to links with Al-Qaeda funding some terror um, organizations and all of that. However, the management of NASCO group and some people who have pointed out, some people have pointed out even before them that it was cleared of these allegations. But the management of NASCO group has also said that the U.S. government, which of course placed him on their watch list, terror watch list, have cleared the founder and that similar investigations were carried out by the National Intelligence Agency which came to the same conclusion as well. Does this, how does this affect your piece? I mean, did you, were you aware of this, that he was cleared of these allegations? So first of all, the narrative that he was cleared, quote unquote, of these allegations is completely untrue. It's completely false. So to, to put it very blunt in the management of, of NASCO group is life. He was never cleared. What happened was, after being indicted, and by the way, you can read the indictment, I linked it. The US uh, Treasury Department wrote a very lengthy and very, very, very detailed indictment. When the US government writes an indictment against you, this is not uh, Nigerian police or EFCC doing a media trial. Though. They have something like a 97% conviction rate. So when they write an indictment against you, it's as good as you being guilty. If you, you did that thing, right? What then happened was later on, I think this was in 2007, it was reported by the LA Times, his name was removed from that list because he struck a deal 
And is that the US government? Essentially, uh, sorry, hello? The deal, is it public information that he struck a deal with the US government? Well, no, because the, the, the US government didn't state what the deal was, but I'm going to quote from, from the story, which, which was published by the LA Times in 2007. Now, uh, the, a former State Department official who participated in the designation of Nasreddin as Right, hello? Is the studio back? I can see them. Right? can't hear them. Why is their mic muted? Hello? Oh, this is annoying. Okay, um, David, can you hear us now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. We have to for some minutes there, so just continue uh, your line of thought. You're about to quote right. LA Times. Uh, right. So uh, the former State Department official, uh, Victor D. Comras, who took part in the designation of Nasreddin as the terror financing entity in 2002, he was quoted in the story and he said, they seem to be saying that he was a bad guy, but that he has renounced being a bad guy. If that's the criteria, a lot of people will try to get to the list. All they have to do is say, we're not doing it anymore. So essentially this, this fellow who used to work with the State Department is unhappy that he was taken off the list. And what he's saying is that based on the information that he has, that essentially he has told these people that I actually did this thing, but I'm not doing it anymore. And this is in black and white here. This is its State Department official who said this. So it's not me that came up with this. So again, the, the management of NASCO is being very clever by heart because they know that most people are not going to read this thing carefully, right? Most people will just say, we just see that he was removed from this list and then they would, and then you know, if if you say that he was he was exonerated, you know, the was like exonerated, and then people will see that he was removed from the list. People will not notice that there's a big difference between being taken off a list and being exonerated. He was absolutely not exonerated, right. They're lying lying by omission. So he was not involvement in terror financing. Is what you're saying? Sorry, what? Not cleared of it, being involved in terror financing. No, absolutely not. In fact, the the quote from Victor Comras basically basically reaffirms that he did it, but that based on whatever deal it was, he struck the U.S. government. He got his name taken off, and I mean, it wasn't stated here, but based on similar things that have happened before, you can infer that there was probably some asset forfeiture involved here, and the U.S. government basically looked at it and said, "This guy is not a threat to us anymore. He does the infrastructure that he used to have to use to use to uh, finance terrorism. He doesn't have this infrastructure anymore." So he's no longer a threat, so we might as well take him off the list. And he's an old man anyway. Uh, what happens? This narrative that he was dead, he was exonerated, is completely false. And I would, I would, I would encourage anyone listening to this to go back and read that story from the early times and read it carefully, so that somebody is not just going to release a statement and claim that so and so and so happened, and then you run with it. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, let's open phone lines now. For everyone who's dropped comments, we see them. They will be read. Uh, David remains with us on the line. But if you'd like to drop a comment, please keep it down to one minute. 0817-444-1067, uh, 0817 0704-400-1067. And for those who are dropping us comments on the Zoom, pla Zoom platform, I would like to also verbally drop their opinion as well. Just signify by raising your hand and we'll get to you shortly. It's going to stick to the drill one minute so that you have. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Yes, you have one minute. Yes, thank you for you, sir. I have been a little hard about this. And it is quite a little. So now, it is very clear to us that the government cannot deny involvement in this area, terrorism, uh, terrorism act. No one people that are directly involved. Do you not think 
the world terrorism in this country can be fought and won. That is my question. Thank you, Rafaela. That was minutes down to less than a minute. We appreciate it. 0704 400 1067. This comment here from Olajuo says, We are in for it in this country. Uh, one would say there's a certain agenda in Nigeria. Some short sighted people will say it is a lie. It is a known fact that Pantami has been fingered to be an apologist of an extreme Islamic group. Gumi has also been moving about conversing for bandits and terrorists and seeking amnesty for them. I take the rest of his comment after this call. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, continues with UAE has sent names of sponsors of terrorists to the federal government, even named some of them, but the federal government has not arrested any. But the federal government was bold enough to say that they will use the, they will name those sponsoring successionists who have not carried guns, such as Sunday Igbo, to kill innocent people all in the name of religion. Indeed, we're in a country where we have their sympathizers as leaders. I'm editing your comment because some of it is just, you know, generalizations, but let's take this call. Hello? Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, please keep it down to less than a minute. Go ahead. Just let me know if my time is up. I'm a Muslim. As a Muslim, a conscious one to the best of my extent and a practicing one in my own right. For record's sake, let me state categorically and emphatically that extremism and all acts of terrorism has no place in Islam. It is found at, hello, are you with me? Just go on, go on, go on. So it is found at, and, and a, a category, a, a, it is a, 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 something categorically forbidden. So in Islam, the only prophet himself had said that his real followers, that you know, he really does, are those people of the world, that is those who have come from extremist conduct, and at the same time, who don't wallow in utter nonchalance in their religion. So this goes to tell us that elements of extremism are being a tale of a tale and even before his time. So, man, extremism, terrorism is not a lot of We have to let you go. We have to let you, you go. have 20 seconds. Okay, let me see if I can still come back during the review of the year. That works fine. That works fine. Thank you very much. Right, uh, we have another caller now. Hello, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning, me. Um, morning, David. For me, I, I don't blame um, this extremist especially the ones in government. I do say that I get more disappointed when my own brother or my sibling is the one that backstabbed me, is the one that joined hands with outsider to hurt me. We have our people in government. They cannot say they are not aware of some of these things, if not all. Why do we still have them cooperating with these people? That is just my own fear. Because they tell us that once the enemy within has decided to kill the individual, the enemy outside will find the job very, very easy. The enemy within is my problem. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Abayomi. On Zoom, if you'd like to say something, just raise your hand and we'll definitely open the line for you Hello. to talk. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. All right, you have one minute. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
All right, thank you very much, Elijah Mitchell, for calling. We appreciate you for sharing your thoughts with us. This comment on WhatsApp is from Candy Gabriel, and he says, I'm short of words this morning. The issue of terrorism in this country is too complex. May God help us. While Samson you, Joseph, says that I think some of us are not too surprised regarding this revelation made by David. We have a Zoom call. Okay. Uh, well, someone wants to contribute via Zoom. Okay. Well, well let me continue with Samson Uju yes, while we set that out. It says it's so pathetic that some hearing this will still say it's mere allegations and religious grievances. The Southwest Muslims still don't know what that what they practice here in the Southwest is very different. The aim is to replicate what the Taliban did in Afghanistan. These people are so powerful that they approve political appointments and determine who goes to power. This government belongs to these people, and we in the other parts of this country are busy speaking the English and amassing degrees. Thank you, Samson. You, Joseph, for your okay. comment. Um, let, let's take a contribution from Zoom. Um, I think this is Ines Somi, Resident and Elushalai Ines Somi. Please unmute your device and then just talk to us. Elushalai Ines Somi, if you can hear us. Uh, Okay, I'm looking at the time really. Uh, Hello, okay, good morning. Okay, good morning. It's gone. Yeah, good morning. It's, it's, yeah, it's quite appalling that we find ourselves in this situation whereby the, these people are in the government, they have access to the government. It's quite sad. And we are here, we we'll speak all the English, we we'll, we'll speak all the grammar. Nothing will be, nobody will be held accountable. Nobody will, will be relieved of, of its, its or our duty, and nobody will be like sentenced to court or give a reasonable something. Mm. It's quite a problem. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sami, for your contribution. You didn't tell us where you were calling from, though, but we appreciate your contribution. I'm, I'm calling from Lagos. Thank you. Thank you much thank appreciated. You very much. Please mute your device again. Uh, David, let's come to you now. Afolabi asked a question about how. If, it's, um, if terrorism can really be fought, I hope we can do this in about um, a minute or less because we have to proceed on a commercial break. Well, I mean, so again, as I said earlier, it's, it comes down to the question of political will. So under this current administration where you have the president himself appearing proudly shining his teeth and appearing in pictures with terrorists, is that president going to fight terrorism? I think the answer is very obvious. So maybe not in this administration, but I think if... If there is a change of power in 2023, which is a very, very, very big if, we don't know that it's going to happen. We don't even know that that it's going to be an election in 2023. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, assuming it happens, and assuming somebody with from a completely different uh, uh, political interest group actually comes into office, then it becomes we have to make sure that this person's feet have to be held to the fire. That mm -hmm. this problem is not just a problem of fighting Boko Haram or fighting headsmen. It's a problem of this. Uh, this, uh, as as I contextualize this, uh, what well, this Wahhabi Salafist movement, which has incubated this entire problem of extremism in Nigeria, that issue has to be addressed for the first time. Mm. Obviously, it's not going to happen under a Buhari government, but you know, we, we wait and watch. Mm. All right. Thank you so very much, David Hundain, for joining us this morning. David is an investigative journalist, a writer, and a broadcaster who's work has appeared on multiple platforms and most recently is the author of the piece conflicts for jihad the book on haram origin story which you can read to find out some of the revelations that he made on the program this morning thank you david for joining us thank you for having me what? all right we'll go on that commercial break and then when we return uh boom. Maybe take some more calls. I'll take calls, take some um, thoughts on WhatsApp, and uh, maybe for those who've left us messages on Zoom as well, and WhatsApp and um, Facebook as well. Okay, okay, so we'll take from those platforms and then uh, we'll proceed with um, the second segment of this from the page. But do stay with us. Smash, station.